All right, so let's continue where we left off uh, last time, um, but with some reminders. So let's see. Uh, I have office hours on Thursday, which is tomorrow, as usual, from 11 until 2 o'clock. So you can ask me questions about your patch or the tickets that you looked at or whatever else um, related to Sage. Let's see, what else? Um, any general questions before we get going? <coughs> okay, so you'll recall that um, last week we did Sage development, and this week we're talking about how to use Cython. So the topic this week is, and maybe some of next week is Cython. And topics that are coming up will be, um, soon we'll do a couple of days on number three using Sage, and solid calculus and so on. But uh, this is kind of one more foundational thing to do before we dive into um, other more mathematical topics. So Cython equals a Python ish compiler. And I write ish just because it's not exactly the Python language. Um, a Python compiler might be something that would take exactly the Python language, no more, no less, and compile it into machine code. And what Cython does is it takes um, a substantial extension to the Python language and turns it into C code, which then gets compiled. So that's what it is. And the example we've been looking at for this class, um, starting on Monday, is computing the function f of n, which is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of sine of i, which has no um, real significance that I'm aware of anywhere. I just kind of made it up as a benchmark. Um, if anybody knows of any reason you'd ever actually want to compute that function, let me know. Um, and we're computing this as a double precision number. So we're interested in input an integer n, but the output is a double precision number. And uh, there is a straightforward way to implement a function in Sage to compute this. And here it is. I note that this is very bad. And in fact, I believe that the version that I will give you at the end of this worksheet about this will be, in fact, 17 million times faster when the input is uh, 10 to the fourth. So, um, so this one's really bad, although it does look natural and like the right thing to do. I mean, it really almost exactly translates what we have over there into code, but it's um, very slow. And the reasons for this basically involve what is what the sign is right here. Um, and the order in which you, uh, like what happens, basically internally right here, it makes this big expression tree that has um, the signs of all the integers. Then it, um, then it turns all the integers into floats, evaluates all the leaves of the tree, and then kind of goes up and finally gives you the sum. So it's an extremely bad way of computing this. And just to um, convince you of that visibly, let's look at how long it takes again for 10 to the fourth. So what we're going to do for the rest of the time, um, I'll very, very quickly show you what we did last time while this is computing. So this was an implementation that is much better than that one by a factor of roughly 1,000 or so. And so that one took like um, 14 seconds. This implementation is different because we use the sign function from the math library. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Instead of using the symbolic sign function that you have by default in Sage, it's using a different version of sign. This is a sign function that whatever you give it, it always just immediately gives you back a double. So the point of that is that if you do sine of 3 in Sage, you just get sine of 3 back. It doesn't do anything further. But if you do math.sine of 3, the one in the math library instantly gives you back a double. And this dramatically simplifies the amount of work that gets done. So that's much faster. And just to illustrate that it's much faster, time python sum 10 to the fourth, we'll see that this is way faster than 17 seconds. It's like 1.6 seconds. So it's a lot faster. But we'd like to do much better. Um, and that's what Cython buys us. So just skipping. So one thing we tried last time was switching to using a for loop instead of using sum. This turned out to make absolutely no difference at all. Then we tried using Cython, 
And what we did was we took exactly the function that we started with, the one that was reasonably fast compared to the very first one. Uh, the very, very first one would have gotten nowhere. And uh, put percent cython at the top of the block. And then evaluated it. And it did give us a speed up. The speed up turns out to be, um, if you take the quotient of the two timings, it's about 1.36. So it's about 30% faster, whatever that means. Um, it's 30% slower, really, to use Python over Cython to do exactly the same thing. And this is the sort of thing that you'll typically see. Cython code, when you compile it, if you compare the timings to corresponding Python code, the exact identical code, often it'll be 30, 40, 50% slower in Python. That, did not always, that was not always the case, but currently it is. Um, now here's a version that is faster yet, and this is the last one we looked at in detail. The difference here is that I replaced the sum command by a for loop. And what happens is that the for loop gets turned directly into a for loop in the C language. Um, looking at the auto-generated code over here, so let me zoom in a little. The Cython code is given, and the code that gets generated, um, you'll see it when I click on each of these lines. So for example, when I click on the line s equal to zero, you see that the generated code is a big C <coughs> comment, which shows you what the code is, and then this happens. It's literally just directly translated. Um, there's something that's put at the beginning of each of the variables in Cython, which, which is underscore underscore pyx underscore v underscore something. It, it indicates something about the type of the variable and so on. Um, but up here when we declared the variable, it actually declared, I guess it doesn't show you anything, but it declared a variable with um, type long called pix underscore v underscore s. Okay, what does the for loop get translated into? It gets translated into a standard C for loop. So it just gets one-to-one -one mapped from what we've written here to what happens in the C language. And then what is this arithmetic expression? Uh, this was a different example, but um, what does this get translated into? It gets translated into the exact same thing. I just realized I'm showing you the example that the compiler optimizes away. So um, let me do the one with sine. So moving down. It took me a while to get there. Okay, so now this is the version of the function over there where we use the sign function from the math library and a for loop, and we explicitly declare the data types. This looks much like what you would write if you were to try to implement that directly in C. In fact, it's almost exactly the same. The only difference is you don't have semicolons. You have this cdef word. Um, in Cython, since Python doesn't, well, since there would be too much ambiguity, Almost everything in Cython that's special to Cython gets prefaced with cdef. Um, there's a whole bunch of different cdef type things. Basically, you say cdef type of a, a, a variable name that, or a variable a data type that would make sense in the C language, and then a variable name, and then and so on. Now let's look at what this gets turned into. Yes. Sure. Long is the is a data type which will either map to a 32 or 64 bit int on your computer, depending on whether you have a 32 or 64 bit operating system, and also depending on um, uh, certain operating systems. Even if your operating system 64 bit, they might actually make it 32 bit. There's, there's some subtleties. So you never really know um, when you're writing the program whether a long is going to be a number between or up to 2 to the power 31 or with a sign or not. So um, it's a, an integer type that is extremely fast um, on your computer, and you don't know exactly what the size is, but it's going to be very likely to be um, 2 to the power of 64, which means you can store integers up to, um, with a, since there's a sign bit, up to 2 to the 63. So long equals C data type that is fast. And it stores <laughs> integers. And when I say fast, I mean really, really, really fast. Um, Basically, if you try using an interpreter like Python to make two integers, like 5 and 7, and add them together, you'll find it takes a substantial amount of time, maybe, maybe 80 or 90 nanoseconds. It's huge. Whereas if you um, use the long data type and do exactly the same thing, it'll take like 1 or 2 nanoseconds. So arithmetic with longs is very, very fast. It's something that your computer can do in one sort of tick of the clock. Okay? And computers kind of run at gigahertz speed. 
and a nanosecond to gigahertz are sort of close. So, um, so if you can rewrite your code so that you're just doing arithmetic with data types like longs and doubles and so on, and for certain problems you can, then um, the resulting code can be blazingly fast, potentially. Double is another data type. Um, let me just write here that this is an int, probably 64-bit. So probably 64-bit. Um, and then double, that's another data type. And this is um, its a decimal number. There's some IEEE standard that um, defines how these decimals get added and multiplied, what sort of rounding errors are made, and so on. And here you have um, a base and an exponent. And this has 50, so the base has 53 bits. And then the exponent, so this is the base, and this is the exponent. Um, as whatever bits you have left to use. So it's being stored in a 64-bit thing, so I guess 11 bits, but maybe there's some subtlety. <coughs> but use the, addition, use the rest of the 64-bit um, word to store your number. And this isn't very big, so one issue with double precision numbers is that they don't have too much dynamic range. So if you want to represent an absolutely enormous number, um, which if you were to write it out would have, you know, if it's if it's a number that's around maybe um, 10 to the 10,000 or something, then uh, you can't really represent it well with a double. You'll just get infinity, just immediately overflows. So it's easy to have these overflow. But if you're working with kind of more everyday numbers where the exponent isn't too big, then you can do arithmetic blazingly fast with these as well. It's very similar speed-wise to this. Um, there are a couple of other data types and various permutations of these. Like there's signed and unsigned variants of long. Um, there's an int type, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, let's see, there's, a char there's pointers. I mean, the C language has a lot of these sorts of things. And you have similar data types in Java, which map to the same thing on the machine. OK, so um, again, the for loop just gets translated into exactly the same Thing. And then this part where it does s plus equals sine of 1, the corresponding generated C code is s equals s plus sine. So um, when you run this function, the speed at which it runs is, it's not just like, okay, we're going to do well compared to somebody writing a C program. It's exactly the same as somebody writing a C program to do the same thing. Because the code that you've written just gets translated to one to one to um, comparable C code. So if you know what you're doing, you can write Cython code that is exactly as fast as what somebody who knows what they're doing can write with C. And so if you're you know, terrified of your comp competition because they're using C and they're writing, and you're worried they're going to be writing code that's much faster than yours, then um, you don't have to be worried if you're using Cython, which you can use right in the notebook with Sage, as, you're, as you can see. Um, and it is a valid thing to worry about. Uh, there is an enormous difference between the kind of speed you can get from different languages. And if you look at um, people that try to write fast programs in various languages, C ends up doing pretty well, usually. OK, so here we are. That, that, let's just look at this example. So this simply um, loops through, adds up the signs of the numbers, and returns the result. Um, you don't have to worry about converting a C double back into some Python type. Cython takes care of that automatically. Um, you don't have to worry that you call this function with something that isn't a long. What happens is for whatever type you try to give as input, Cython will try to turn it into a long. And if it overflows, it'll give you an error. If it works, then it will give, it'll turn the input into a long and then run this code. So it takes care of all those um, transitions back and forth between objects at the Python level and Cython or C data structures. Okay, so let's just compile this again and see it go. So, um, by the way, f of 1,000 is about 0.81, so that's a good little double check that of sanity. And then running this one um, turns out to be pretty fast, and it turns out to be about, um, you know, depending on when you time it, it, turns out to be about seven times faster than 
the uh, very comparable version written using Python that we started with. So seven times speed up is what you basically get in this example by going from Python to Cython. Okay, so a function that looks very similar in Python to this. Um, if you just take the exact same function with no changes at all, we got a speed up of about 30 or 40 percent. But when we declared data types explicitly and we said we wanted to directly use the sign function that's defined in the math library, doing those two changes, we got a speed up of a factor of seven. Okay? And that's pretty significant. That means that, uh, I mean, that sort of speed up is important. It might mean that something takes one hour instead of seven hours. And that's a huge difference. Okay, moving on. So um, there's a library called NumPy, which I'll mention off and on in the course. And you can use it as another approach to trying to compute something like that quickly. And let's see what it does. I'm just kind of giving one screen to it. It turns out it doesn't do very well compared to Cython. But here's how you do it. So um, actually, it'd probably be a little fair if I move this import out, because that actually uses a very slight amount of work. OK, so what this function does is it creates a NumPy array um, consisting of the integers from 1 up to n. A NumPy array is just some data structure that um, it's kind of, it's a certain type of array. Uh, oh, I forgot to say what n is. So just as an example, here's the NumPy array of the integers up to, hmm, I wonder if, it just occurred to me that if I do that, it might be faster. So um, in NumPy, you can specify the type of the entries, and it looks like in this, I hadn't specified them to be floats, so we'll see if that makes a big difference. And maybe I'll break this up into two lines so it's easier to read. So I'll make a NumPy array. Um, there, oops, I forgot to do this sign. OK, so this is a different way of implementing a function to compute the sum of the integers up to n. What it does is it makes this NumPy array. It requires the types of the entries to be um, double precision floats. It then applies a function that's defined in the NumPy library called sign to the array. And what that does is it, um, entry by entry wise, computes the signs of all the um, entries. This is a, um, so by the way, these NumPy arrays can be n-dimensional, not just one-dimensional. They're not just a single list of entries. You can have a two-dimensional array that might represent a black and white image, like giving the, grace, the gray intensity. You can have a three-dimensional array, which you could think of as an array of two-dimensional arrays. And you could think of that as having kind of one array for each of the colors. So red would be one, green would be another, blue would be another. And for all these sorts of uh, complicated, potentially complicated, uh, but fairly homogeneous arrays of data, you have functions like sign that you can apply to all the numbers all at once. Um, and there's much more you can do. You can, you can take these complicated n-dimensional arrays and slice them and dice them using a notation that's similar to the list slicing notation that we saw before. So NumPy is extremely powerful for manipulating data and in um, just a little bit of code calling a function on that data. So what this does is it returns a new NumPy array with the same size. So it's a one-dimensional array. And then it will take the sum of the entries in there. I suddenly wonder if there's a NumPy.sum that might be faster. Hmm. There is. This might be really fast. I don't know. I think that when I wrote it before, I wrote it too naively, and I didn't, maybe I didn't take full advantage of some of the clever things in NumPy. So we'll find out. It could be blazingly fast, or not. I don't know. Well, that's pretty good. So let's see, that's uh, 841 microseconds. So that beats the, that beats the original <laughs> Python one. So it's 2.4 times better than the original Python one. But remember, the Python one I wrote was seven times better. So um, using NumPy, you get a pretty good speed up, a factor of 2.5. But using Python, we got a factor of seven. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, Still, seven hours versus two and a half, or seven seconds versus two and a half. That could be huge. If you're, writing a web, if you're making a website that's doing some image manipulation, and it takes two and a half seconds to show you the result, then you'll have much happier users than if it takes seven seconds. So I think there's some like magic cutoff where if something takes longer than three seconds, people get really frustrated. 
I've discovered this with the Sage Notebook. Um, that a lot of people get frustrated because sometimes things take more than three seconds. Okay, now the final thing we're going to do with this example is to change the algorithm that we use. Okay, so um, if this were just the sum of the first, <coughs> it's hard to see the whole thing there. Okay, if this were just the sum of the first n integers, you would probably know that there's a formula, um, a simple formula that gives you the, the closed form expression for the sum. I.e., the sum is i goes from one to n of i is equal to n n plus one over two. So um, most people will be aware that there is such a formula, and probably will even maybe they'll even know the formula. Um, so, or at least you might not most people, but most math majors at least, because if you uh, ever take a class on how to write proofs, then you'll learn about proof by induction is like the first thing you do, and this is kind of the first example of something you prove by induction. You just add n to both sides, do a little algebra, and the formula continues to hold. Um, you might not know that there is a formula for f of n as well, a close formula for this. Um, although maybe, I'm starting to think that maybe it might be a standard calculus exercise. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it much. But without thinking about it at all, you can find a close form formula in Sage, because Sage can do that sort of thing. So this um, sum command that I mentioned, it has um, some additional abilities beyond just summing up a bunch of numbers. So let's do sum and hit the tab key. So I can show you the documentation on sum. But uh, what you can do is, in addition to just summing up a bunch of things, there's a sort of symbolic version of sum, where you can sum up an expression where a variable goes from one bound to another. Okay? And the um, lower and endpoint, the lower and upper endpoints of the sum don't have to be explicit numbers. They can be variables as well in Sage. So here what I've done is I've made i and n symbolic variables, and then I've asked it to compute the sum of i, that's the expression, sum I, uh, sine of i, where i goes from 1 to n. But notice I haven't said what n is. So maybe I'll do this in steps. So. Let that be S. So it simplifies it, I guess, immediately. But um, maybe just for just so you understand what this is doing, let me give one where it's you know not easy to simplify it. So at least I, I think I don't know. I have no idea if this will be easy or not. Jeez, I guess it is. Okay. Uh, I'm just typing in random summons. Okay, there. So what it will do is it will attempt to simplify the sum to find some closed form. Um, expression for the sum using, you know, some algorithms that people came up with in the 80s probably. And um, if it fails, then it just gives you the thing back. By the way, there's something similar in Sage for integration. There's a command integrate that works just like the sum command, and it will attempt to compute a symbolic antiderivative, and if it can, it just gives it back to you. And if it can't, then it just gives you um, sort of formally integral of this expression without saying what it is. So that's what's going on here with this formal sum. So we compute it, and there it is. It's kind of big, so if you do full simplify, um, sometimes what this will do is it will apply a bunch of transformation rules and try to simplify the expression. And then it, it just, full simplify just applies all the ones it knows. Um, and here's what you get when you full simplify. So it is a bit simpler, as you can see there. And um, if you do show, you see it printed out. And of course, you can get it the LaTeX by clicking on this if you want. So there it is. And this doesn't look too hard to evaluate. Notice in particular that if, as n grows, it's not really going to be any different. The complexity doesn't really depend on n at all. Um, whereas if you compute that sum over there, it depends a lot on n. It's basically a linear, some constant times n. That's the complexity of all the algorithms we talked about so far. Yes? And why does it say f n is of sine or cosine? Why is it just one? It could, um, it could say that. It didn't simplify it. <laughs> it doesn't have that rule or something. I don't know why. But you can look at it with your, your mind. And, you know, if you can think of something better, then that's good too. 
Okay, so let's just implement it. This I, all I did was just copy and paste the formula. And here, um, there's a little bit to be learned here. So one thing I did was I said from math, import sine, just like before. But I also imported cosine. And I imported, in the math library, there's a function called atan, which is arctan. But it's not called arctan. And instead of having to change everywhere it says arctan here to atan, I did import atan as arctan. What that does is it imports the thing, the function that's called atan in that library, but calls it arctan. So that you can refer to it as arctan inside of your code. So that's kind of convenient to have. And now um, here's the actual implementation. It's pretty straightforward. And of course, it's going to be very, very fast. So the original Python implementation took about 2.07 e to the minus 3 seconds. This Python implementation takes, um, it's 56 times faster. It takes far less time, 41 or, you know, 36 to 41 microseconds. It takes very, very little time. Maybe it's a little slower because I'm not plugged into the outlet. But um, it's dramatically faster. And of course, if you plug in a huge n, it's going to be the complexity won't depend at all on n um, because it's just a single formula. OK? Now, the final thing is that we can now implement exactly this formula but in Cython instead of Python and see how much faster that is. Because after all, in Cython, we can directly get access to the sine, cosine, and arctangent functions on our operating system and uh, at the C level and do all this arithmetic at the C level. And that should avoid a bunch of um, unnecessary error checking and stuff that slows us down and dynamic memory allocation. There's all kinds of overhead in evaluating this. So let's do it in Cython. So here's what I do. I declare those three functions. They're in the math library. And then I write my formula. And I explicitly declare that I want the input to get converted to a double before I do anything with it. So remember, double is the <coughs> C data type for a 53-bit um, floating point number. And then I just put these, the formula from above. I didn't put 1 half, though, because in C, 1 divided by 2 is 0, just like in Python. Um, the semantics for division of integers in C is somewhat similar to Python. So that's why I put 0.5. Um, the rest I just left. And of course, one could simplify sine of 1, cosine of 1, arc tangent. Any of that could be simplified. And that would lead to yet another speed up. Um, it could be that the optimizing compiler will simplify that anyways, though. Um, in any case, if you compile this one and then try it out, you find that it takes only 900 nanoseconds. So it's um, 40 times faster than the Python version that we just implemented. <coughs> okay, So it's way, way, way faster than the um, original Python version. It's over 2,000 times faster. But it's, in particular, it's 40 times faster than the Python version of exactly the same thing. So this shows you an example where using Cython and a little bit of declaring data types, you get a speed up of a factor of 40, which is pretty good. OK? And at the same time, you're also getting exactly the speed that you know, some clever person using C would get. That said, um, uh, some clever mathematician, such as Andre, might um, decide to apply some additional identities he knows about to simplify this expression a little bit, and then it might be much faster yet. Yes, your comment. Our question. Uh, uh, no, I had to declare them right here. Why? Ah, uh, so this tells Cython. So, if you want to use a function that's defined in some C library, then you have to explicitly tell Cython, "This is a function I want to use, and this is how I want you to treat it. I want you to view it as taking a double as input and returning a double." For example, the issue is that. Um, C and C++, especially C++ libraries, they can have many different versions of a function that are completely different depending on the type of the input. And um, in Python, you don't have that notion at all. So what you do is, let's say maybe there are three or four different sign functions in C++. There aren't, but if there were, then you could explicitly say, I want to use the one that takes as input a double and gets back a double. It's very similar to explicitly importing these functions in the other example. Up here, notice that um, in the Python implementation right here, we explicitly imported sine, cosine, and arctangent. So it's kind of similar to that. You have to explicitly um, do this. Also, if you look at the auto-generated C code, this triggers the um, 
this, in the C code, you'll find a hash include of math.h, which is a, a header file. So cdef extern from is very similar to hash include in C, except instead of getting every single thing that's in that header file, you just get the things you explicitly declare. Um, there are also a large number of libraries, for example, um, the GMP library, the GSL library, where all the declarations for the entire library are provided in a single file for um, Sage to use. So if you're going to use one of those libraries, you don't have to redo these declarations. Um, there are most libraries there, we've already done them. Um, also, there are a whole bunch of uh, standard libraries that get included or get dash L'd, if you know about using GCC, when you uh, do percent site on here. But if there's some other library that you want to use that's not amongst those, then there's some, um, uh, what is it, a pragma, that, there's some comment you have to put inside of this block, which will allow you to explicitly tell Cython, by the way, link in this other library when you're compiling this. Um, I think it's the Clib. You have to put a comment in and say Clib. So it's something like, I think it's like this. Oops. Um, hash Clib M, for example. I think that forces it to link in the dash M library, uh, dash LM. Or maybe not. Hmm, what went wrong? Uh, library not found for dash L. Dash L. Hmm. Oh, maybe it's without a colon. Yeah. Right, so let's suppose that you want to link in some library like, um, I don't know, my super library. Then you'd have to type hash clib space my super library so that the compiler would know at, when, when it's linking together the code that it's compiled to include the um, symbols from that library, if necessary. This will make absolutely no sense to you if you've never used um, C before. But if you have, it might make sense to you. Basically, this just allows you to um, put dash L something on the command line. That's what this thing does right here. There. OK, so um, there you are. It's faster. And compare it to the original, very first naive thing that we started with. It's uh, the original one to do 10 to the fourth took 15.88 seconds. And this new one takes a few hundred nanoseconds. So the difference in speed is 17 million. So uh, it's pretty shocking that there are two reasonable looking ways of coding something up. And one of them is 17 million times faster than the other. And of course, I could have just started with 10 to the fifth instead of 10 to the fourth. And then that 17 million would have been much larger again. Um, Um, it wasn't that long. I think it was far less than 17 seconds. And of course, you only have to do it once. But um, we can time that. You don't. You wouldn't have to do that. I mean, the non-simplified version is almost as fast. There's also the compiler that has to get run. Um, so that was the simplify was 82 milliseconds. But still, I mean, comparing that to the 17 seconds, that's not so bad. Uh, I'm not sure how long it takes to compile this. That would be interesting. By the way, when in the notebook, whenever um, I think let's see, I think I can do Cython.eval. Actually, this may or may not work. I'm just trying to figure out how long this takes to compile. If this doesn't work, then never mind. Um, oh yeah, you're not allowed to do that with Cython. Sorry. Uh, oh, I can do that. So. Does that work? Just trying. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like it takes one second to compile the program. Okay. So that is that. Now, Cython can do a lot more than just allow you to write functions. Um, you can write a class, and then you can also put percent Cython above it, and it will Cythonize that class. It'll the class the code will look the same but um, the entire thing will get compiled and potentially be faster. Again, the faster will turn out to be like 30%, typically. Um, as an example, let's consider this. And um, we'll look at this example in great detail. It will allow us, by the way, to give a more natural implementation of that, uh, at least the brute force version. 
So I'm going to make a class that represents a, the instances of this class are vectors with floating point entries. And um, the attributes of the class, you have the number of entries in the vector and the actual entries. Okay, so that's what's in the class. So I'm storing this separately, though you could recover them from, the, from this V. Um, so just think of this as a vector of floating point numbers. It's a very common data structure that you would work with in, um, in uh, any applied mathematics type of context. So let's go over this class very quickly. Um, the init method, so when you make a new instance of this class, the init method will be called with x. If x is an integer of some form, and in Sage there are three different types of integers, ints, longs, and Sage is an integer class. If it's one of those, we're just going to make a vector with all zeros that is um, as long as that integer. Alternatively, if it's not that, then we'll hope that whatever we got as input is something we can iterate over and turn all of them into floats, and we'll make a vector out of that. Okay? So you'll be able to type float vector underscore python, and then in parentheses you can give it, say, 20, and it'll make the zero vector that has 20 entries in it. Or you could give it a list of numbers, like you could give it range 20, and it would give you the vector with entries 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 19. So that's the way you can create an um, instance of this class. And then there are a couple of methods. I wrote a wrapper method, which um, displays the vector. And what I do is I just take the underlying string representation of the list of entries, and I think of vectors as having round parentheses instead of square brackets. And so I just replace these square brackets by round parentheses. That's all. Um, I also wrote a function that takes the sign of all the entries in the vector and makes a new vector. So it returns a new vector with sign applied to all of the entries, just as an example of a function. Here's a function that sums up all the entries in the vector. And finally, here's a function that computes the dot product of this vector and another vector. And also does a little bit of checking and makes sure that the two vectors have the same number of entries before computing the dot product. Okay, so let's try it out. So this is just a slightly more complicated version of a class. You've seen classes before. Um, so make an instance of it. Notice it prints differently than a list. It has round parentheses instead of square brackets, as you can see. Um, you can take the sign. And what it will do is it computes the signs of all the entries there, and then gives you back a new vector with the entries, the signs. You can ask it to sum up the entries. You can ask it to compute a dot product. You can ask it to um, compute the vector that you get by taking the signs of the numbers from 1 to 1,000 and then summing them up. So we get our familiar 0.81. And then finally, we can time how long this takes. And this is yet another way of implementing the um, function from before. OK? And now we're going to take this class and re-implement it in Cython. This is not going to be very difficult. All we're going to do is take exactly the code from above and put percent Cython above it. And one other thing, we're going to put from sage.all import integer. Because when you do percent Cython, it doesn't know about anything in the sage library. In particular, integer is not there. Let me show you what it would happen if you don't put that. It'll try to run the Cython compiler, and it'll give an error, undeclared name not built in integer. Um, that's at the very bottom right here. So what you have to do is go from sage.all import anything where it gives you something like that, where it should be something defined in the sage library. So that's why you put from sage.all. That's the sage library import uh, integer. One other um, difference. So when I did this, when I was preparing the lecture, I actually had a bug in my program. And by using Cython instead of Python, I discovered that bug. The bug was that I, um, I, let's see, I left this N like that. I just imagined that there was an N there. Look what, I, so in Python, I'll show you what happens when you do that. If I just put an N here. You evaluate the code, no problem. It'll even run fine, because we're not actually executing that part of the code. Okay? So it's perfectly fine. It'll, it'll be wrong if you actually try to, um, go th if you set x to be an integer so that it tries to evaluate the first chunk of code, then that would give you an error. But as long as that code isn't run, it doesn't care. You can just put whatever random thing you, there you, it, whatever you want there. What's the 
Well, the error is that the n is, is like nowhere in the scope. It's just going to, it's potentially a very subtle bug. It's just going to use whatever n happens to be. If you happen to say n equals 5 and then call this, it would just use 5. So it's a really bad idea, right? So we really want this to be self dot underscore n. Now, look what happens when I compile exactly the same code down here. It says undeclared name not built in. Because Cython is a compiler, it doesn't, it, it literally looks over all the code first and interprets it in some way and it can do various things. It knows that there's no possible way that n is going to make any sense in the Cython code because um, it's just, it hasn't been declared anywhere. And it'll tell you that at compile time. So when you use Cython, you have a lot of the benefits of a compiler that you don't have with Python, which is kind of nice. Um, okay, so let's fix that back. So this makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, now if you click on the um, HTML link right here, then you get this. Notice that there's a lot of yellow there. That should warn you that though this is in Cython, it's probably going to be pretty slow compared to what you could do. Typically, when you compare, if it's very white, then that means that you're maybe you're aiming for a sort of optimal performance. Um, modulo having, modulo making a different choice of algorithm. Whereas if it's very yellow, maybe without changing the algorithm at all, you can make your code a lot faster. And this is really yellow. Okay, but anyways, it wasn't much work. I didn't, the only thing I had to change when I copied my code over and put percent Cython was I had to explicitly import integer and I had to fix bugs that I really would have wanted to fix anyways. Okay, now try it out. The Cython version, it works pretty much exactly the same, and the difference is that it's uh, twice as fast in this case. So it's faster. Um, now, finally, I'll show you this class, but I'm going to um, pull out all the tricks in Cython. So, um, so remember, one trick is that instead of calling the Python sign function, I can call the one that's in the C library. So I'll do that. So that's why I explicitly declare it here, just like before. There's some other tricks. So instead of using a list to represent the elements of this uh, vector v, I'm going to use a pointer to a double. This is um, something that will probably make no sense to you if you don't know the C programming language, because that's kind of like C and C++ are really the only languages that use pointers a lot. Um, but hopefully you'll bear with me for a moment. What it, what it means when you say c dot double star underscore d is that instances of this class have a pointer to an array of um, double precision numbers. And um, uh, and so on. So And then I have a long here. So what happens right here is when you create an instance of the class, Let's just look at this because this is similar to the one we looked at in detail before. It initializes self dot underscore n just as before, but it also initializes self dot underscore v. And it does that as follows. It allocates memory by calling a function sage malloc, which is just a lightweight wrapper around malloc. And it allocates exactly enough memory to fit self dot underscore n um, copies of something that has is a double. So size of double, I think, is... Um, uh, probably eight, I don't know, but it's, it doesn't matter, it's just built, you don't need to know what the size of a double is. It just allocates that much memory, it explicitly casts the resulting memory to a double star, and then it stores it in this class. And then finally you initialize the memory with the entries in X. There should be some error handling here, and I've completely left it off. For example, this malloc thing that allocates memory um, if you ask for an enormous amount of memory and it isn't available, instead of giving you some nice error, it'll just return a void pointer. It'll return something that's equal to zero. And your program, if it you know, happily just pretends like that memory is valid, um, will quickly segmentation fall and kill your whole program. So there should be double checking here. Like I should check that self dot underscore v is not equal to zero or null, because that would be very bad. Um, another issue with this class is I never free up that memory. When you allocate memory using malloc, you have you should free it. If you don't free it, it just gets wasted. And um, I haven't written the code yet to free it. It's the sort of thing you never have to worry about in Python, but you have to worry about a lot in Cython. Yes? 
Yes, it's exactly like in C. In fact, if we just, so the rest of this is kind of the straightforward stuff that you pretty much expect. Like you call the sine function, as I mentioned. There's the sum, which I just unroll. I, instead of using sum, I use a loop. Um, or the dot, I also use a loop, etc. And now let's look at the corresponding HTML. Notice that it's a lot less yellow. For each function, there typically is some yellow maybe at the very beginning or the end, as it does some sorts of type conversions. But a lot of the code in the middle is just white. OK? Yes? Yes? Well, it's not really a lot of time. It's just a heuristic. It colors it more yellow based on how many calls to the Python C API you have. So for example, uh, here, there's a whole bunch of calls to the Python C API. A lot of code is generated, whereas here, there are no calls to the Python C API. Of course, it could be that you're calling some C function that takes 20 years, and the Python C API call is instant. It doesn't know the difference. Really, the yellow is just telling you, here are a bunch of calls to the Python C API. So it could be, I mean, it's, it's not really running the code and profiling it. There are tools that can do that, though. OK, um, and now running it finally. It looks just like, uh, oh, I have to actually compile it. So it looks exactly like before. I mean, from your usability point of view, it's, it's identical. The difference is, in this case, it turns out it's um, almost 13 times faster than the Python version of this class that we started with. So the Python version took a certain amount of time. Rewriting it in Python was about twice as fast with very minimal modification. And then modifying it to um, be much to use much more uh, subtle C type ideas, namely dynamic allocation of memory, et cetera, got us another factor of six. So on the other hand, now we have a memory leak. We have, I mean, this if you run this over and over again, it'll, the memory usage of your program will just keep going up. Maybe I can illustrate that. This is very bad. Um, if you do get memory usage, that tells you how much memory is being used. And if I do that, and then do get memory usage again. Look at that. It was using 1,058 megabytes. Now it's using 1,074. And I haven't done anything. I mean, I've done some work, but I haven't allocated anything in addition. It's kind of ridiculous that it's wasting memory like that. And if I do this again, then it'll use up even more. So every time I call this function, um, I guess it's calling a few hundred times, maybe a few thousand times, it's wasting memory. That's because I wrote this without uh, something that will explicitly give back the memory that's been allocated. Um, but we can do that. It's not hard. You have to say, you have to define a method called, I think, dalloc. Or wait, what is it actually? I think it's dalloc. I can't remember. Um, maybe do sage underscore free self dot underscore b. I think it's dalloc. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, some other special method. So let's test this again. Um, and now it doesn't leak memory. So you have that. But this whole memory leak business is a huge issue if you're trying to write really fast Cyclone code. And if you're you know, pretty serious about writing you know, fast code in Sage, at some point you're going to end up messing around with Cyclone. So um, yeah. OK, so now that's properly done. But again. All I'd have to do is try to allocate a very, very big vector, and then this would return a null pointer, and my program would just go boom in the worst possible way, I assume. Since class is about to end, let's do that. Um, so I'll just ask for a vector with 2 to the power of 50 entries. Obviously, it can't possibly allocate that much memory. Boom. Right there in my you know happy, friendly Sage notebook, which never crashed, I have malloc. The operating system at least prints out that something went wrong with malloc. That's just a nicety of OS X. And then uh, unhandled segmentation fault. This whole thing is now completely crashed. And that's it.